I thought when I began this video I would have to tell you would that I was there to see it or even better screen capture it because apparently someone on Karen Stoll's now's Indiegogo donation site wrote a very telling comment. Now, whoever is running the day-to-day -day on Stoll's Now's donation page deleted that comment before I could capture it, and deleted the same message when it was posted for the first time some days ago. Fortunately for me, Slime Pitter A+, fast on the capture, came through. The comment reads, Karen, since your fundraiser started, I have found out about your history of domestic violence and other people have come forward saying that you falsely accuse them of sexual harassment. Is there a way we can get our money back if what we're hearing is true? Other people have come forward? Yes, one person is Reap Payton, he of the Angry Atheist podcast. Reap has been friends, or at least was friends, with Karen Stolznow's now husband, Matthew Baxter. Stolznow seems to have been, at least in regards to Reap, one of those women who likes her man to ditch all his friends on her behest and is willing to do what's necessary to make that happen. My capsule summary can't do justice what Reap has written about this incident, but it's kind of like this. As part of Karen Stolznow's active fantasy life, where women want to be her and men want to do her, she claimed that Reap Payton came on to her, suggesting a three-way, what the French refer to as le grand lumpa fugly, between her, Baxter, and Reap, or more specifically, that Reap do her while Baxter watches... No, never mind. Just read what Reap wrote. The link is in the description. The point is, the suggestion to make the beast with two backs, six eyeballs, and two and a half brains actually came from Stoll's now. Those like me who are steeped in batshit crazy studies recognize Stoll's now's proposition for what it was. She wanted to be wanted and wanted Reap to accept her proposition so she could shoot him down. My stomach, not nearly as strong as it used to be, refuses to entertain the possibility that anything would have actually come of this. What did come of this is that Stoll's now suddenly the rejectee rather than the rejecter went into full-on screaming, no mere man turns me down mode, and she does a little pure ego revisionism on her proposition, turning it into a tale of her sexual harassment at Reap's hands. Now, for those of you keeping score at home, this is exactly what she did when she told Ben Radford she was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Matthew Baxter when it was she who was the one who got arrested for domestic violence after biting and scratching Baxter, apparently moved to righteous fury over the fact that he once had a relationship with a woman who wasn't her. Now, I understand the problem some people have processing Karen Stolznow's behavior and the tendency people have to believe her and even donate large sums of money to her. The problem is usually prefaced by a caveat such as, well, why should, would she lie or it doesn't make sense that she would do this? Why? Because liars lie. Because very often, things that mentally unstable people do, by definition, doesn't make sense. And how people who are in the skeptical community can fail to realize that some people, even people also in the skeptical community, are just fucking nuts, is beyond me. I have enormous respect for the restraint Ben Radford has shown in trying to clear his name. The restraint that often borders on the ineffectual. I also have enormous respect for Reap Payton for coming forward as he's done. It's not easy. But there's a lesson here for those who are willing to throw away their presuppositions and stupid little agendas and rigid gender politics. People are far more complex than stereotypes, and interactions between people, friends, enemies, lovers, and the like are far more complicated than the cardboard shadow puppets people play with online. You see, I, like many people, not men, mind you, but people, have someone in their past who was attractive, charming, engaging, like the flashy bauble at the end of a cruel hook. Mine I lovingly refer to as my psycho ex-girlfriend. 
Not to be confused with my ex-wife, who was a fucking saint, really, and put up with me well past the point anyone not steeped in 2,500 years of Confucianism could be expected to. I dream of my ex-wife. I have nightmares about my psycho ex-girlfriend. Now, she was a tall beauty of Slavic descent, looked and talked like Catherine Hepburn, and could turn on a dime and unleash daggers of vindictiveness that was only tempered by the fact that, in the end, she had no idea what in hell she was doing. Fortunately for me, she couldn't commit herself to being my own worst enemy because she was too busy being hers. Now, this experience doesn't make me a general expert in fucked up dysfunctional people. However, borderline personalities are like obscenity. You may not be able to say what they are, but you know them when you see them. For example, my psycho ex-girlfriend made the claim that I put a video of her on the internet, which sounds pretty tacky. In fact, the claim is intended to put exactly that uncharitable interpretation into your mind. It took me forever to figure out what in hell she was talking about until I realized she was referring to this sequence from a video I shot in Rock Creek Cemetery. That's it. That's the mind of your unstable ex-lover who has gotten into their head to use whatever they have at their disposal, even if they're just table scraps, to punish you for slights real and imagined. And your psycho ex is like an abuser. You think back and wonder if you could have told what they are, but you're blinded and if you're lucky you finally realize what they are when they smack you or bite you or use whatever they have at their disposal to hurt you. And some people, even when that happens, still don't get it. I learned my lesson. Ben Radford probably learned his lesson. And I'm sure many people who donated money to Karen Stolznow's Double Down Revenge Palooza have learned a lesson about literally writing a check that their brains can't cash. Still others, by sheer force of will, haven't learned a damn thing and never will. And still there's work to be done. Now forget what greater issues all this might represent in an atheist and skeptical community torn apart by woo-peddling, carpet-bagging, creepy clowns trying to sell the sum of all fears in sexual politics, and remember that one man's reputation, one man's life, has been all but destroyed. Ben Radford isn't just some inert data point in the statistics of false accusation. He's here and now, and this is still going on, and this yet can be changed. Thanks to the reflexive knee-jerk gullibility of some people, and Karen Stoll's now selling her lies as a crusade on behalf of victims of sexual harassment, she now has some very deep pockets. Recent filings for changes of jurisdiction, venue, and outright dismissal show that rather than taking her day in court, as she defiantly put it in order to get people to part with their money, Stoles now intends to bleed out Ben Radford's limited funds until he is unable to fight back. We've got a few hours left and Ben Radford is several hundred dollars short of his goal of $10,000 needed to begin to clear his name. If Ben Radford meets the goal, he will be able to fight on without Rocket Hub, the funding site, taking a big chunk of what little money he's raised. In the time remaining, I urge you to give to Ben Radford. If you've already given, I urge you to give some more. And if you're watching this video as a contributor to Karen Stolznow's Mendetta, who regrets spending your dollars to further harm a falsely accused person, well, Stoles now isn't about to give you your money back, but you can throw good money after bad, even the scales, and redeem your own error by contributing to Ben Radford now.